Good evening and welcome to the Lompoc City Council meeting. This is September 1st, 2015. Madam Clerk, can we have roll call, please? Councilmember Mosby? Present. Councilmember Vega? Here. Councilmember Homdahl? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Dirk Starbuck? Present. Mayor Bob Lingle? Here. Please rise and join me, join uh, Pastor, or excuse me, Cap Chapton Dale Wallace <laughs> in the invocation. Sorry, you get it right. I promoted you. Pastor, chaplain, minister, just <laughs> brother and good friend. Amen. Amen. If you'd bow your heads, please, and join me. Father, we come before you just thanking you, Lord. We have the chance to be here with people who have sacrificed their life, Lord, and volunteered to do your, do your work in our city, and we thank you for them. Lord, we ask you to bless them with perseverance, with insight, Lord, with discernment as they go through and conduct the business of our city. Lord, we ask you to bless them with long-term thinking and that they continue to keep in mind the greater good of our city. Lord, we thank you for them because it is you who empowers them. And Lord, now before we sit down, we just want to know that they would uh, want me to say a special thank you for those who protect our city, those of the police, those of the fire, and those of the first responders, that you will bless them, you will protect them, You'll go before them and go behind them and on each side of them. And Lord, in this special, in this particular time, that you will bless them with safety. We honor you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you. Okay, we're, we've got a couple presentations tonight. First, I'm going to read a proclamation honoring September being declared Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. We have one here from the Cancer Awareness. Okay. This is a proclamation, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas the American Cancer, Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection Report, cancer is a leading cause of death among diseases in the United States children between infancy and age 15. This tragic disease is detected in more than 15,000 of our country's young people each and every year. And whereas one in five of our nation's children loses his or her battle with cancer, many infants, children, and teens will suffer from the long-term effects of com com comprehensive treatment, including secondary cancers. Whereas, founded over 20 years ago by uh, Stephen Firestein, a member of the philanthropic Philothro Max Factor Cosmetic Family, American Cancer Fund for Children, Inc., and Cancer, Fact Cancer Connection, Inc., are are dedicated to helping the children with and their families with this fatal disease. Whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection provides a variety of vital patient psychological services to children undergoing cancer treatment at Santa Barbara Cottage Children's Hospital as well as participating hospitals throughout the country, thereby enhancing the quality of life of these children and their families. And whereas, the American Cancer Society Fund for Children and Kids, Cancer Connection, also sponsors Courageous Kids Recognition Award ceremonies, community Get Well cards, and hospital celebrations in honor of the children's determination and bravery to fight the battle against childhood cancer. Now therefore, I, Bob Lingel, Mayor of the City of Lompoc, do hereby proclaim September 2015 as Children's Cancer Awareness Month and call upon the citizens, community agencies, religious organizations, medical facilities, and businesses to increase their awareness and participate in the efforts to help fight childhood cancer. Thank you. Okay, and now we're gonna have a presentation by Mr. Kenestini from our Chamber of Commerce. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members, city staff, viewers at home. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here to see you guys, so I have a, not a lot, but uh, some things to go over real quick. So going back a ways, uh, hopefully some of you were able to attend, uh, this goes all the way back to June 4th, the HR seminar we had at the Dewey Center on the uh, new uh, sick leave and annual leave policies. Uh, went very well, had a huge uh, turnout of folks. We had an attorney out of uh, the Ventura area come up and conduct that to help folks understand the importance of uh, the new law that actually took effect in July. So uh, that was a good one. Uh, that same day, had an economic development committee meeting that evening. Um, on the 12th of June, at, I attended at the Federal Correctional Complex. Their RDAP program is a drug and alcohol program. Uh, the inmates go through, and if they complete the nine-month-long program, they get time reduced from their sentence. And there was like 23 graduates. It just really it was an outstanding program. Um, glad to attend that. On the 15th, attended the Criterion Bike Meeting as we were planning for that event. Um, on the 17th of June, went to the Economic Vitality uh, Team Meeting in Santa Barbara. Um, that's moving along. Um, on the 18th, we had a mixer at Rabobank. Hopefully some of you made that. Um, I know I see a lot of you at some of these different things. Don't ask me to remember because I won't, won't be able to do that. Uh, the 23rd, attended the Vandenberg Air Force Base Newcomers Briefing. Uh, again, attend those uh, twice a month um, to make sure folks know what's going on around our community. Uh, that same evening, the Community Bank of Lompoc held a mixer. And then that evening afterwards at the Parish Hall, we had our window award contest along with the beautification commission uh, and their yard decorating contest that we do every year right before Flower Festival. And that went real well and appreciate the support of the, uh, of Cotty and the beautification commission in, in making all this happen together. So uh, on the 25th of June, attended the graduation of Coast Valley Substance Abuse, their graduation. Again, another good program in our community to help people struggling with drug and alcohol problems. Uh, they probably had, uh, oh gosh, I bet at least 50 people at that ceremony. And again, they have to complete a program before they can graduate. So that was a good program. Um, on the 30th of June, we presented the, new, the newly formed Lump of Wine Alliance with a check for $850 from the chamber, money we've raised over the years with our wine events at Old Town Market. So kind of got them rolling. And I'll talk a little bit more about some more money they've been able to receive, but that's kind of a start to get them moving. Uh, that evening had a ribbon cutting for the new expansion at Pizza Garden. Hopefully many of you have seen that. On the 4th of July, we held our, our annual military affairs concert in the park at Centennial Park and our kids bike parade. And this year the bike parade was just packed. It was loaded. It was too big to get one loop around the park without overlapping the next part of it. So yeah, that went real well. So uh, again, good kickoff of the day and, uh, on the 4th of July. Um, on the 7th of July, Victor will remember this, I, I think hopefully you remember, I went and spoke to the MOS group, the Multiple Listing Service, is that the acronym, Victor? Are you sure? Okay, I spoke to the realtors about things going on in Lompoc, and always interesting to speak to the realtors and hear what they have to say and share with them what I know is going on in the community. Um, that same day, uh, Explore Lompoc had their regular monthly meeting. Um, that evening I attended the going away for the wing commander, Colonel Baltz and his wife at Vandenberg. Uh, on the 9th, they had the change of command for him and welcomed the new commander, uh, Colonel Moss, to Vandenberg. Um, on the 10th of July, of course, Old Town Market started. Um, same weekend, uh, Piper Cub Fly-In, which was another huge success, I think. Um, on the 14th of July, also attended another Vandenberg Air Force Base Newcomers Briefing. Maybe I'll lump those all together next time. Um, and again, every week through the end of August, we had our own town markets, which um, just want to say th those things went extremely well, I think, this year. And uh, I know I saw many of you out there. Uh, and want to thank the city for the help with that event, because without the city's support, it would be difficult for me and my other two staff members to pull that off. So the city support is tremendous for that. Um, on the 22nd of July, we had our annual awards dinner for the chamber, uh, recognition of Man and Woman of the Year. I'm sure all of you know who that was, uh, uh, Dave Baker and his wife, uh, Dr. Teresa Martinez Baker, Man and Woman of the Year. Um, uh, on the 23rd of August, attended the police department business leaders meeting at the Foursquare Church to talk about the walk-arounds that uh, Chief Walsh has started. I've not been able to attend one of them yet because he usually had them on Friday nights, which is when we had Old Town Market. And by the time it got 8 o'clock, I was done for the night. So, um, but I hear those are going fairly well. 
Um, on the 27th of July, the Explore Lompoc group gave money to the Wine Alliance to help them again get started. They plan on doing a, a Harvest in the Ghetto event sometime in early November. So I'm not sure where they're at, what they're planning to that, but Explore Lompoc helped them with some money to attract people here. Um, on um, the 13th of August, I attended another event at Vandenberg with the, for Brigadier General Garland held a reception for outgoing Lieutenant General Raymond and incoming Major General Buck. Um, that next day, um, they had the uh, promotion for, for General Buck, the Lieutenant General, and the change of command of General Raymond and General Buck. Um, 17th attended the last, 17th of August attended the last meeting for the Creative Crosswalks Project, which of course we all know is now in place. I saw somebody actually out there painting on it today. I'm not sure why, but somebody was painting a piece of it again today. So. Um, but it's, it's held up pretty well, I think. Um, on the 20th of August, we had our orientation night for parents and kids for our next class of Youth Leadership Lompoc Valley. That will be kicking off with their retreat in uh, September 12th and 13th. Uh, Bob knows all about that. <laughs> He'll be right there with them. Um, so that's, that's gonna go well, I think, this year. Again, we have 20 kids and two, uh, two liaisons. On the 25th of August, uh, attended and emceed an event for Congresswoman Lois Capps that she holds every year for veterans at the Vets Hall. Uh, had about probably close to 100 people maybe attend that, and she takes time just to really talk to them and see what their concerns are, and if there are issues, she kind of refers them to one of her staff and says, okay, get some notes here and let's go back and work on these things. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, 27th of August, we had our Old Town Market After Action meeting to talk about next year and about things that maybe need to change or, or work on. Uh, again, overall, pretty good feedback. Uh, I think it went real well this year. Um, last Friday, the 28th, we had our annual Military Affairs Barbecue at Vandenberg. Uh, we barbecued for probably over 1,000 military people, provided them with chicken, tri-tips, beans, the whole nine works. Went extremely well. Uh, tough day though, it was hot. It was really hot. So the water really went well. Fortunately, we, we had 36 cases of water to go through and, and a variety of sodas. Um, that same evening, we had a ribbon cutting for a new business here. Again, I know some of you were there. Island Mixes, new restaurant down on, uh, on V Street. Uh, hopefully, hopefully wish them a lot of success. And then this morning, we had uh, our monthly, again, monthly Explore Lompoc meeting. So. With that said, if there are any questions, then just by the way, the, city, the report we do semi-annual will be emailed to Teresa tomorrow morning. So it's done. So, yes, sir. Councilman Starbuck. Yeah, out on base in the retail facilities, there's a bus tour of Lompoc. Do you know anything about that? A bus tour of Lompoc? Yeah, really? it's, in, it's in the commissary, the exchanges, and it's, it's a very big poster that says, you know, for newcomers, a tour of the Lompoc Valley. Hmm, I'll, I'll, I, I don't know, but I'll find out. I'm wondering if that's something that's done through their normal uh, newcomers orientation they do. But they do, they're do doing different stuff all the time. But no, I'll definitely find out and see what that is. Anyone else? Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Okay, let's see. This is city administrator's report. I, vo I voted instead of turning on my mic. It's a, it's a tough technological challenge up here. Um, thank you, Mayor. Three quick things. Uh, first of all, just to follow up with you from when we last met and the, uh, you, you had voted on the revenue share agreement on the Summit View annexation. Just wanted to report that the following Tuesday, the Board of Supervisors uh, approved the same uh, revenue share agreement. So at this point, um, I've handed the package back off to the planning staff who is um, wrapping up things for LAFCO. LAFCO was only waiting for those revenue share agreements to be able to conclude the annexation process for the Summit View annexation. So uh, we're expecting that to be concluded here um, in, in fairly short order, but just wanted to report the outcome of that and what's underway. Also that I had attended a uh, community relations board meeting at the prison and um, just to let you know, we keep in close contact with both the, the Air Force Base and, and the prison. They're important community partners to us 
and uh, so so we participate in what's going on there. I I was at the you know it's great for to see the creative crosswalks uh, dedication get done. I'm really looking forward to doing more of that. I appreciate your support um, to this point, and um, if if we have resources that become available through this last one was done through a grant. If we have more that become available, we'll look forward to expanding that program. I think it's just a great opportunity. Not only does it give us something that's um, you know, a little unique, but also just a chance to promote pedestrian activity. And then when we do that around storefronts, that helps with uh, economic development as well. And um, finally, uh, that's, that same night, I had... Uh, I was happy to celebrate a uh, 39th anniversary with my wife, and uh, so uh, we, we, we're uh, doing great. Thanks. Congratulations. Okay. We're going to go into public comment on the consent calendar. This is your opportunity to speak to us for up to three minutes on anything on the consent calendar. Pam Wall, resident. Um, I have a couple things on the consent calendar. First of all is the minutes. They don't get posted online, yet they're approved at every council meeting with the exception of one when the date of approval wasn't on there. I'm just wondering if this could be routine to post them after the council meeting. Once you approve them, they should be posted online. The second thing is I would like to suggest that perhaps a council member or the mayor could um, request pulling item number five off of the agenda, which has to do with the settlement with the county of Santa Barbara for the utility over and under charges. Just for clarification on what was written in the staff report. Um, for example, the city was first formally notified of a possible overcharge, but it doesn't say by who. Did the county notify the city? Did an employee, did a resident, did the consultant that we have, who notified the city of the overcharge, or the uh, undercharge, overcharge in that case. And um, that was going on, the electric on the R Street was since 2009, but the wastewater charge is under it, it's through 9914, but when did that start? The electric charge has to do with metering, but the uh, wastewater would not be included in that. And the amount from the electric department is considerable. The net effect here after the um, undercharges are removed is 234855 But the electric department is over a quarter of a million dollars, and that is significant, 251363.38. Now, the other accounts have to be reconciled, and how is that done? Does that come out of electric? Where does that come from? It doesn't come out of the general fund as this states. So how do we reconcile? It's primarily the wastewater account. I, I don't know. Um, and the other thing that I have a question on is that it states the statute of limitations currently one year doesn't apply in this case because uh, the county is a political subdivision of the state of California. So my question, I guess, would be, does this 1% statute apply to the city when an undercharge error is discovered on a business or a residence account? And or if a customer claims an error on their billing and it's discovered it goes back more than a year, are they only allowed one year? And if that's the case, I think that should be stated on the bill. Um, and I'm wondering how many more accounts, as we go through this audit, are going to be impacted. Um, I don't know, meter changes or whatever. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of unhappiness in the community over their uh, billings and not understanding how their wastewater bills are charged. You know, Facebook is not a place to get facts. And so I'm not giving this to you for the facts. But so much for the misunderstanding in the community and why they feel like they've been charged in correctly, and some of them explain it here in pretty good detail. So for your information, it's just for your information. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Consent calendar. Okay, seeing no one rise, we're going to bring back to council. Does anyone from the council wish to pull anything from the consent calendar? 
Okay. Uh, can I have a motion? I'll move the consent calendar. And do we have a second? I'll go ahead and second it. I just wanted to make comment here also. There's other issues, Ms. Wall, on the utility that later on when I have enough information together, I'm going to do a council request concerning this. There's several other tentacles than just this one, so be assured it's being looked at. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5-0. Thank you. Okay, staff presentations. We don't have any staff presentations. So we move on to oral communication. This is your opportunity to speak to the council on any item for up to three minutes. If you have, come forward. Hello, my name is Jerry Blake. Thank you for seeing me. I'm here over your dog ordinance to spade and neuter. I got a dog and I got him for protection. He's a German Shepherd. I did not know about this ordinance because it didn't apply to my previous dog. He was altered. I got him and I was able to easily make him my emotional support dog because it was a required situation by the city of Lompoc. Um, I paid the fees and he was licensed and he's been licensed for 11 months. At eight months, I got a notice on my door or my gate saying that they had no dog licensed at that address. I called them up and provided them the information, took all his papers down to them, and they said, handed me the same form that I had filled out the previous year for the city, only this time it had an exclusion on the bottom that said, emotional support dogs do not apply. I live in an alley house where my entrance is the alley. I've been robbed several times. I've been mugged getting into my home by kids, six kids between the ages of 11 and 15, I suppose. This dog protects me. He keeps me safe. I have a deadbolt on my gate. He's not loose running around. If he does get loose, today I had somebody jump my fence, open up the deadbolt while I was in the shower, and he let, let the dog out, basically. When I opened up my front door, of course, he went outside the the gate and he was in the alley but he stays right by the gate because he doesn't go anywhere without me because he's a mommy's boy you know I am not planning to breed him I have been disabled for several years I could easily probably go get him licensed as my disability dog however the county city animal control is requiring that I pay to have a certified um, dog trainer train him which will cost me way too much money I cannot afford such a thing I've had several shepherds in the past and each one has become complacent once they're fixed and lazy I don't want to fix him for any reason to breed him at all I want to fix I don't want to fix him I want to keep him because he takes care of me we walk twice a night uh, during the day and he he's turned into such a great dog I can drop the leash and he runs right back to me and and hands me his leash thank you for seeing me okay thank you okay anyone else okay seeing no one right did, did you, sir did you have something yeah. okay Sterling Ram to member of the city. Uh, how you guys all doing today? Uh, just wanted to drop off one of these to each of you.
It's a good picture, though. Thank you. <laughs> okay, get, get in front of the microphone. As far as a whole, um, I think we could operate a little bit better as a community and you know, not so much as a city versus people or vice versa. And uh, I hope you guys all have a great night. And uh, read the article. It's really good. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one rise, we're going to close uh, oral communication and bring it to staff requests. This is uh, City Manager Patrick Wymill is going to present a review of water utility rate charges and easements for the property located at 500 West Willow Avenue here in Lompoc. Thank you, Mayor. This item is being brought forward uh, from a discussion we had a couple meetings ago. Um, Mr. Leslie has been appearing here over uh, several meetings time. Uh, stating his case uh, concerning his property his, and his billing on water and wastewater charges. And so um, we decided a couple meetings ago that this would be the meeting where we'd uh, go through and address that and um, air out the issues as we understand them. Um, at the conclusion of my remarks, I hope you'll provide, Mr. Leslie is here, I'd hope you provide him adequate time to respond and present his side as well. I'm presenting from the city's perspective on the issue. So as you can see, we have basically two, two issues at hand. One is whether or not the property should be paying uh, the regular city rate or one and a half times the water and wastewater rates uh, according to the city ordinance. And then the second issue is, does the city have appropriate easements for reservoir drain line and water lines that are across and or adjacent to uh, his property. So let me start here with the water rates. And um, not to get into great detail about the resolutions on the left, but to sort of capsulate what's in there and what's appropriate is if we are focusing on uh, 6A there, which calls out, as you can see on the right, that for water rates, rates of 1.5 times the minimum rates for customers outside of city limits have existed in the fee resolutions since at least 1975. Secondly, with wastewater rates, same thing you can see from a resolution on the left, but particularly as we point to summary that's on the right side here, that the rates of 1.5 times the minimum rates for customers outside the city limits have existed in fee resolution or ordinances since at least 1989. I point out those two things, the wastewater in 1989, water rates going back to at least 1975, uh, because it's pertinent to the time frame in which uh, the Leslie's have owned this property, which dates back about 13, 14 years. So those have both been since that, that has been since the time that we've adopted a 1.5 times multiplier for rates outside of the city limits uh, for both water and wastewater. And their property does sit just outside of the city limits. Here's a quick uh, screen capture uh, showing an aerial view of of the um, of property in question. A couple things to point out here. First of all, this is the Leslie's home right here. Here's our water tank. Um, and you can see what's plotted along here in this yellow line is the line that comes down here. Then right here at the corner of the property is where an easement exists. And that's where this line then traverses to head into a, a basin that we have. This portion of the property along here is a portion that the city has that's about a 20 foot wide strip and the city owns that in fee title. So the issue we have about the, um, where, where the placement of the line is has to do with a section that's just right here on the corner. 
So first of all, to talk about that placement, uh, the, the easement is established through this grant deed that was uh, that, that dates back to the year 2000. So that would have been a couple of years before the Leslie's owned it with the prior uh, owners, the Campbells. Uh, so I just point out, you know, you can see the dates here. This has been notarized. Um, and the grant deed is, uh, this is a document that entails five uh, pages altogether. There apparently has been some confusion at times uh, because three of the pages that we're about to look at constitute a single exhibit, and they are listed as one of three, two of three, and three of three. They sit on pages two, three, and four of this five-page easement deed. So here's the cover page of that deed. Uh, we'll also, I wanted to point out one more thing. Uh, the words here, for valuable consideration, uh, that's standard language because to have a valid contract within the state of California, you have to have consideration on both sides. Uh, and so this merely points out that there was consideration given. It doesn't tell us what that consideration was, merely that consideration is given. So the second page of this five-page document is the first page of the three-page exhibit. This is what actually describes, give, gives a detail of, of where the, this language just de describes where this line is running. This uh, page then shows their property, and as I pointed out before on that GIS picture capture, that corner that we're cutting apart across, so tanks up here, lines running down here, and it cuts across right here. This is what's being shown uh, from this document back in 2000 of where it occurs. So this is at a, um, you know, at a, at a larger view. Now we're gonna zoom in sort of in the, the next final page of the, of the exhibit portion of the document, page four, shows a little more close up detail of how the line runs. And then finally, this is showing it's been notarized. This was the, the recording of the document. So that's the five pages that we have that, that are our demonstration of legal entitlement to be able to have this easement and have the water line that runs across uh, that corner of their property. Sometime later, uh, this is something we've um, discovered a little more recently. Sometime later, in this case in 2010, is a public utility easement deed that was also involving that same corner of the property. In this case, it had to do, uh, I believe, with our fiber optic line. Is that correct? Yes, with the fiber optic uh, line. So this is a six-page uh, document deed that, that discusses that. Uh, here's uh, notarization uh, that you can see going with with this. Here's the description again, similar description of the property involved. Uh, drawing again, showing that corner of the property, and you know the final certificate of acceptance. So then. There's also uh, uh, just one more document here to share. This is an older document, it dates back to 1961, I believe that date is. It's back quite a bit. It's fee title for the O Street Reservoir Pipeline. So this is the fee title, that 20 foot wide strip that I was just showing you shows, and it's hard to see on this picture, but again, if we go back to the screen capture here, uh, that's what's talking about this parcel that runs right along here. So um, now we're, we get into some correspondence that's gone on at the time that um, there had been a, a, a I, as I understand, a letter from Mr. Leslie to the city uh, 
wanting to understand exactly what the charges would be. This is uh, his letter to the attention of Gary Keefe, who was the city administrator at the time in 2003, Saskin City of Lompoc to uh, install a water meter and electric service in the alley between L and M. Um, so, and the, the implication I, I reading the last line here is how much will it cost taking this into consideration? We are buying uh, water and electricity from you. Be nice. So it indicates his understanding there would be uh, there's going to be pricing involved. He's hoping that it's reasonable pricing. Uh, there, so there's uh, a few days that that was on. That's a letter dated June 29th. Uh, a couple weeks later, on July 11th, uh, Susan Segovia, uh, is, who's one of our staff members, receives a letter from Gary Keefe. Gary Keefe had been the, prior to being city administrator, had been the utilities director and was sharing his uh, uh, recollection, his, his understanding and his best recollection at the time, at least, of what um, what is involved, what the charges should be, and uh, part of trying to read through. So it's talking about it. It's my understanding at the time that the city of Lompoc would waive AB sixteen hundred impact fees and the like. So he's talking about some waiver of fees, but um, that. That the work had been um, completed, meter installed, hydrant is installed, drain was installed. So the bottom line is please assess no AB 1600 impact fees for that installation. And uh, that the other fees are as applicable. So from there, on that same date, then uh, Susan Segovia takes that information, or, uh, sends the reply to uh, Ray Leslie based upon the information that we've gotten. And she says that address, your address, is located in Santa Barbara County. Therefore, in other words, not in the city of Lompoc, the 1.5 multiplier applies for fees, following fees apply to the single family home located at 500 Willow Avenue and it lays that out. And furthermore, later in that month, on July 29th of 2003, more detailed letter uh, laying out all the appropriate charges, including the cost of water will include a 1.5 multiplier above the rate because your property is located in the county. And this is just page two of that document, wrapping up a list of the fees. Finally, just this final takeaway, we've got that explaining here on the right that um, this is written by our finance director It's part of the comprehensive review of utility charges initiated um, with the arrival of when I, when I got here it was determined that the wastewater charges had not been assessed at all against Mr. Leslie's property at the time it was connected to the system up until 2014 and that the water charges had only been assessed at the regular rate, not at the 1.5 rate. His calculations, his cumulative calculations for the wastewater charges that went unbilled that should have been billed, $6,983. And for water service charges that were billed only at straight time rather than time and a half, the, the, the value of those under billings about 5,406. So altogether there was some $12,300 and change of underbillings that occurred between water and wastewater over the period of time from when the Leslie's uh, commenced their account up until the time that uh, we discovered the error in billing. 
Um, and here's a note, I guess, dated from May uh, that Mr. Leslie provided to us, signed by the Campbells, that their recollection was that the agreement between the city of Lompoc related to that grant deed that we were first showing back in 2000, that that valuable consideration was indeed that the rates were gonna be at the standard city rate of at straight time rather than at 1.5. This is the only document we are aware of that has that. We haven't been able to find that in our archives. We haven't been able to find it in any recorded document. Uh, what we have is this letter that was signed by the Campbells making that statement and uh, that they apparently wrote to um, Ray Leslie and he in turn uh, shared that with us earlier this year. So the summation is based upon the preponderance of the evidence, if you will, of what we have, we have felt that the appropriate charges were for the water and the sewer rates to be at 1.5 times consistent with the code. Um, and all of our recorded documents and communication seem to have indicated that, that the underbillings that occurred, the non-billing of sewer obviously was uh, an error, because um, this doesn't mention that that should, should have been waived and we couldn't waive it and uh, furthermore that the water should have been at 1.5 but it was only at straight time so that I really are my my point was to make to the Councilman Starbuck. presentation of facts to you there thank you there, there was just three questions <clears throat> that, that I'm going to bring up I, I don't expect you to have the answers right now but I think that maybe next meeting first off a calamity of errors on the city's part here, zero billing on the sewer and one multiplier billing for 11 years. Mm -hmm. It's a long time and we're having this in other areas of the city currently. The other thing, could we go to the GIS sure. overview please? The property that's immediately to the west there they're not in the city. What are their billing? What, are, what is their situation and status point, then? 1.5. They are paying. We've gone in and actually looked at this and this property. That was my understanding, yes. That in the, we, were, we were asked about that. Uh, Mr. Leslie first asked me, and then uh, we went and checked all, all those county properties being served, and yes, okay. it's at 1.5. Um, the other thing that... Surely the Leslies are not the only ones that are affected with this. What say that the, they decided that they wanted to go ahead and annex into the city so that they could have utilities at the standard rate? If we could maybe outline a process, because I think there's other people that eventually may want to consider this. Yeah, if I could speak to both the other two points there. First of all, in the billing issue, uh, we recognize we've got a, we've had a flawed system in our billing. Um, and this isn't to make any excuses, and um, you know I I take full responsibility for for this and, and getting it corrected. But uh, so not an excuse, but an explanation. As we've discussed several times, we have an antiquated fi financial uh, automated financial system. Uh, automated is a term I use loosely in this uh, regard because in a true automated financial system, we would be able to commence a, a service in, from, from one action, one location, be able to rectify that between the physical service going out in the field, uh, the service being billed, and um, ensuring that the, the rate variables are accurate. And we'd have, um, we, we just have a, a better process, better tools to be able to do that. In addition to having a process where we have to go in and and, um, and, and verify that the information is correct. Uh, as I explained before, our solid waste, to start solid waste service actually involves us putting pieces of information in four different places. And so obviously it can get prone to error between um, what you think you have in place in terms of your assets, like bins and things like that, how it's showing up on a route sheet, how it's being billed, and what's really being collected can all have the potential 
of, of having a different profile to it. We need to fix that. Uh, we don't have any excuse for why we wouldn't be um, have billed his uh, sewer, for instance, other than when we commenced and we were keying in back when the original information into the account, somehow that line item got fixed, probably a, a, a data entry error. And we were missing the components that would have said, for instance, in a modern electronic system, that would have said, hey, you've got an outlier here. here you've got something that doesn't look right to the system. Can you recheck that? And would, would cause a, an exception report to happen. So not only would the person look again and make sure it's right, but then you'd have something going to the supervisor to, to follow up and, and ask, uh, what happened here and how's it been resolved? Can we look at the account? So we have a path toward getting uh, fixes. Um, it's, and we're underway with that, but it's one of those things that's like turning a very big ship. It takes miles to turn it because it, the last thing we want to do is rush out, get a system that isn't uh, properly adapted to our needs and end up in the same boat with a different set of problems. But we are, it is a priority for us and you've been good enough to help commit the resources in that direction. Uh, Ms. Wall asked the question earlier about, well, how many more, you know, uh, accounts might be affected by this? If I, it's, a, it's a great question. If I knew the answer to that, we wouldn't be having these issues. It is the unknown that is our, that is our challenge. But um, we're working for that. We've obviously had, we've made discoveries of both underbillings and over billings as we've been working our way through our utility system and we're seeking to, to reconcile those and we'll continue to reconcile those. Uh, we're not waiting for the automated system to get in place to do the homework that we need to do. We're working our way through all the customer accounts. We have thousands of customer accounts yet to work through. On the issue of annexation, um, I'd, I'd have to say it depends, and you're right. I'm not going to have that answer for you tonight, but I'd be happy to come back with what we understand on that as a possibility. If we have land that's already been identified in a sphere of influence, uh, you know, an urban growth area and the like, it's a lot easier to proceed if there's this desire to do an annexation. It's a lot easier to proceed through the process with that then if it's in our general plan, we haven't identified it that way, we haven't identified this land for future annexation, then we'd be starting a whole new process that includes environmental considerations and the like. So that's a, becomes a much longer process. So rather than speculate, I'll do the homework and uh, report back to you. Councilmember Humdahl. Yeah, a couple of things. One is that uh, I thought we already discussed it one time, the uh, sphere of influence of the lower end of Magalita Canyon. We had it before this council at one time, and I thought we passed on it to go ahead and have it in the general plan. Well, I'd, I'd appreciate the opportunity to verify I do that know. information, have, inform have a response for you on that in two weeks. Yeah, because that, we give them a chance to come in. The biggest concern a lot of them have is the pipeline to get to the sewer line where it's going to go, in. but there's also some of the homes up there that are awfully close to the China Creek up in there, which is going to, going to cause them some problem not be able to drill again because it's going to be penalizing the, uh, the water system. So that they're going to have to find a way and we're going to have to work with them in that. But that's one way we can have is that if, if you want to not pay one and a half percent, 1.5, then you come to the city. But the other thing I had a concern on some of the documentation you were showing me with the notary. Yeah. As a notary, a lot of them look illegal. Really? You know, some are not filled out right at all. Well, you know, some of those were from quite some time ago. I know, too. but anyway, they were notari certified notarized people, and the document they had is some of the same stuff we look at now, and some of it doesn't look good. And as a notary, if I sent anything like that in, I'd be out of business right now. So I think you may want to double check those, have somebody come and take a look at them, because there's some not filled out all the way. I don't care what year go back to. I've been doing it since 93, so it isn't uh, something like that. But anyway, that, uh, the, the idea of annexation up there and the sewer and how we can go ahead and get people in, uh, 
because I've got a real concern that because they are starting to reduce some, some sewer systems up there and they're going to have to eventually plug into the city. Councilman Mosby. <clears throat> um, if you could go to the third of the last page, the, the document dated July 29th, 2003. And on the, on the bottom there, you have one and a half time multiplier, but I believe that was for uh, construction water, right? It, when you read down in there, the last paragraph. I'm, right, one, two, you're on, uh, during construction, you can use hydrant water and your construction water tools will cost 700 plus the cost to be used. The cost of water will include a 1.5 multiplier. And I, and I think that's identifying the construction water. Okay. But I, and, and I've gone through here and I haven't really seen where we told him, and I'm not saying this is an excuse for not charging one and a half times rate, but we, we have things in the fees are gonna be one and a half times rate. The construction water will be one and a half times rate. But do we have something, um, I don't think he was identified in here that his water or sewer would be one and a half times rate. Um, on this document from July 11th, 2003, 500 Willow is located in Santa Barbara County. Therefore, the 1.5 multiplier applies for the fees. The uh, following fees apply to single family homes at 500 uh, Willow. Right, so we, we've got fees and construction water. And I, I okay. you know, I, I, I just was pointing that out because it was kind of glossed over and made it look like we, were, we identified, but I don't think there's anything in here. Did you see anything that identified the rates? I wasn't the rates? meaning to gloss anything. No, no, I know well, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just, but, um, I mean, because I think solid waste is also two times rate in the resolution. If I remember right, it was reasoning, uh, which is something new. I, I didn't even know myself that actually outside city limits in the county if solid waste pickup is two times rate. Um, so there are, I mean, it was new to me and I've been around a little bit. So there are some of these, and I guess we went a number of years all the way up Megalito Canyon and doing that. I mean, kudos to you to finding that and cleaning, cleaning up a lot of that. I know it's, 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 people are pointing fingers asking why, why? Well, I'm glad at least we're getting to it and, and are cleaning up a lot of that. I know there's like 51 accounts uh, in Megalito approximately that we're also um, being mischarged, weren't being charged the one and a half times rate. And now that you've, I'm, I believe I'm that's sure what it came that. out. It's about 51 accounts. Brad, are you aware? I'm not aware. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know the number of accounts that, that the utilities have been working with up there, but there are quite a, quite a number. Yeah, I came out, I think, that number at utility commission meeting. So just yeah. okay. also to point out that, that it's not just like somebody was singling out one person. There's a long, I think the letter went out last summer. Again, the, when, when I, I started working here, my commitment to you was that we were going to, before we started talking about new or increased taxes, we were going to go after the revenues we were entitled for, those things where we were earning revenues but not collecting them, and we were going to we were going to collect them. And so part and parcel of that was examining utility rates. It's not limited to utilities, what we've been doing. We've done it with uh, our TOT, transient orient uh, occupancy tax, and with property tax, with sales tax, with business tax. Um, we're hitting every line item. So you're right, it's not, in, it's not focused at any one account, not at the Leslie's. Uh, it, we, are, we are auditing our system. I just were pointing that out as well, that there were, I believe the letter went out last summer to a lot of the people at Miguelito Canyon and other areas, um, they, reminding them they're one and a half times rate. So, uh, I mean, it, I, I know it doesn't seem right, but it is right. So I, I appreciate you guys cleaning that one up. Mr. Weinmer, just uh, one comment. I believe I'm correct. You can just verify it. So earlier this evening, we discussed an item where we had overcharged a client and we've discovered that or it's been discovered and we are 
now paying back that amount of money in full. Correct. What we're discussing this evening is we are not that $12,000. We're not asking the resident to pay for our mistake of back uh, and not collecting. We're just saying from this day forward, that's what the fees are going to be. Is that correct? We haven't asked him yet anyway. Okay. I'm, I'm going so to. So we are, at this point, we, you know, we have not asked for it. Correct. Okay. Okay. Anything else for Mr. Weimiller? Mr. Leslie, would you like to come forward? That's just the first page and advance forward with this one. Yeah, just forward there. Forward and back. Okay. And then the red one's the pointer if you want. Thank you. Well, number one is, hi, I'm Ray Leslie. <laughs> uh, this letter that we've got from the Campbells, uh, they're a very prominent family in this town. They have been forever. They're not going to write something and uh, put it down to where they can get themselves in trouble to help me out of something. This was all done when I bought the property. And uh, while we were doing the property, there was quite a few city workers up there because we were installing electricity, uh, the sewer, I done myself. That runs actually five blocks the opposite direction. We crossed the channel with steel piping. It was a, quite a challenge, but we did it. And uh, I didn't know we weren't paying any uh, money on the sewer, but uh, that's, this water thing is just kind of out, of out of control. It's all the stuff that I've brought to you guys to show you what we've done. And uh, when I come in and talk to uh, Larry Bean, I showed him uh, some uh, information where the guys that were on site <laughs> and I had their business cards and I kept a whole book on building the house. Everybody, every's name, whether they were with the city, the county, it had their business card, a little notes in there, and I still have all of that. And I showed it to him, and there was a guy in there that was with the water department, and he was up there working on the project with uh, Raul Gonzalez and these guys doing electrical, and he put a statement right in my book that the water would be at city rates. When I showed that to Larry Bean, he took it over to the gentleman. I guess he still works here. I wasn't there when he showed it to him. And he said he doesn't remember saying that. I wasn't there, so I don't know if the gentleman said that or not said that. Larry Bean come back. But for some reason, Larry had some type of a problem with me. He uh, got in an argument with me that I never returned. I didn't say one thing back to him. He was yelling in his office at me. And it's been that way ever since. You know, he's never been able to talk to me easy on something, and a lot of it was some of the paperwork that you were showed up there, items uh, uh, one through five or what it is. Uh, they, I gave a copy of all this to, to the city and to all of the council people, and on the front of this thing here, it has one through five on it, and the numbers are about this big. And the one through five, uh, goes to all different pages with different numbers, but there's nothing, this is, uh, the other one was uh, uh, one through five, and uh, this is a different document, but then it goes to 3.3, 3 of 3. It doesn't have all of them in here. It's not, it, he handed me this here whole deal saying it was a complete document. It's not. There's stuff missing. It's numbered wrong. If you look at the, the size of the lettering, one lettering is one size, the next one's another size. Uh, it's, it's not a clear document. It's not has nothing to do with anything. It's, it's, the grant deeds, it uh, tells you in here that they were supposed to give us uh, uh, compensation for putting it in there, Consider, uh, considerable compensation of putting it all, all of the piping through our property. All right, if you look at the easement going through the property, the 20 foot one that comes down off the top of the hill, uh, it's right on the edge of my property. And if you look at the actual uh, property line on my property that comes off the reservoir, it, mine it right now goes right up into where your easement is. The easement that you have that comes off for the drain line 
that comes off the tower. It shows on there that one inch equals 20 feet. Uh, they messed up on it too. Your line is way into mine. Uh, everything, the electrical stuff, the communication box is on my property that's not in the easement. So there's actually, we, we looked at it real close. So uh, there's, there's some problems with it. And it's just measurement problems. But the easement doesn't cover where all your material is, where the telephone pole is. Not in the easement. It's off the easement. It's on my property. It's not in an easement. It's on my property. Uh, when all this was going, like I say, it's been since I, before I bought the house that everything was decided and told to me that it was going to be city rates. And it's been that way. And I don't see now why we change. If you're looking for dollars to take dollars from people and to do things like that, which he's saying that he wants to go back and collect all of the back dollars. If somebody really cheated you and owed you money, sure. I agree with you. But when somebody makes an agreement, gives you an easement, and lets you go across their property, and then they give you that, uh, there it shows. But now that I look at your easement, the property, the way it shows it, and I measured it, the easement shows that your fire hydrant in the meter box is actually not in the easement. It's on my property. Because the easement's 100 something feet by 40 feet or 60 feet or something like that. And I measured it out, and you're not in it. But who cares? Not gonna bother me, it's been there forever. You know, I'm not going to make you dig it up. I got mad the other day and I <laughs> threatened to do something, but uh, yeah, because I was frustrated. And you know, when we do stuff like this, uh, we're supposed to be a community and work together and do things together. If I was cheating you, sure, come after me. But this was something that I went through when I bought the house, or bought the property, I mean, and built the house. It was all down in black and white. I thought everything was done. Been paying that forever. I mean, I don't cheat anybody. Never have and never will. You know, my, my deal going through the government jobs that I was on proved who I was. I was on every government base you can think of. They didn't give me them clearances that are higher than almost anybody in the United States because I was a cheat. And I don't understand why we're going through this now. You're making it real tough on my wife and I. I just quit my job and stuff and we're trying to settle in and this isn't gonna do it. Uh, we closed down the businesses and uh, we're trying to get things going and see if we could uh, get our life together and it's not coming together very easy at all. I think that you should, I hope all of you read all of this stuff and went through these papers and you see what I'm talking about with these documents and. Uh, and what I was given and what I think happened. But uh, then I understand that uh, Mr. John Lynn had something to do with this. I kind of investigated a little bit farther and found out that he was involved in it. And him and I had a little blowing up on his uh, motorsport park and I got out of it. And uh, this is right when all this come about. I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not, but uh, uh, if it is, uh, it's not too cool when you're a mayor and you attack somebody in the public because you want to get even with them. Not the way we should do business here. You know, we've been coming to this town and being in this town since the 40s. My brother was stationed out here at Camp Cook. Uh, so we've been around here a long time. I've been coming here since 62. And uh, I really enjoyed the town. I had a lot of fun here. I met a lot of great people, a lot of ranchers and stuff, and I've had a fun time. Uh, if this happens, I'm going to say goodbye to you guys. Uh, I'm not going to be called a liar and a cheat in a town I live in. I hope you make the right decision, and I hope you guys do it right. I hope you've looked into it good. And like I say, if you look at most of the documents that were up there, I was going to show you, but it's not going to get anywhere. But if you look at most of the documents that are up there, they've been phonied up. Thank you. Okay. Anything else from the council? Councilman Mosby. I got a question probably for the city attorney. If somebody were to get a, a one times rate and, and somebody did this, it was for consideration of an easement, you know, a, a regular 
line worker in the field wouldn't be authorized to give something like that. Well, I mean, how, what, who could authorize something like that? Unless the city council has authorized someone else to do it, only the city council could grant that kind of a in perpetuity reduction in rates. And I, I, don't, I don't know of anything in any of the rate policies that the city has that allows anyone to do something like that other than the city council. And there's specific um, case law that says a city has to have a formal agreement if the city's gonna be bound to something that someone is saying the city has to do. So you, like through resolution or something, you'd have to do something or, like or that? Or an agreement like the settlement agreement that was on the agenda tonight for the um, settlement of the county claim. Right, so there's a regular... A handshake wouldn't work. And, and anybody's saying that. I mean, now, I'm not saying... I know you guys spent a lot of hours trying to find some documents, and I see that you did come up with another one from 2010. And... Um, it's safe to say there isn't another resolution out there around that time frame or did anybody review the, the council are the council meeting minutes available from that time did somebody review those documents with would, would have identified something in there or i ha i haven't looked at minutes no okay, okay. Before we conclude this, before we conclude this. Okay, um, there's actually no action requested on this, so we're just going to receive the report, and we're going to take a 10-minute break right now. Uh, Ma Mayor, just to clarify, I was asked in the course of this to return with some additional information, which we'll bring back to the, at the okay. next meeting. Okay, so we'll return to the additional information at a future date. Okay. Yeah, I, I plan to have that, that answer at the next meeting. Okay. Uh, let's take a 10-minute break.
Okay, we're going to come back. We're going to go on to new business. Item number seven, adoption of ordinance number 1616, parentheses 15. Chief Lada Powell. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Kurt Lada Powell, uh, serve as your fire chief, and a few other things. Uh, before you is requested action that's been mandated by the state of California in response to uh, Assembly Bill 2188. Uh, I actually had an opinion, an opportunity to offer an opinion and proposed edits on this bill via the League of California Cities when it was introduced, most of which were ignored. Um, in essence, what... <laughs> In essence, what this bill mandates is a, quote, streamline process, unquote, to uh, the installation, to the permitting process, the plan check and permitting process for small rooftop residential solar energy systems. And it compels us to adopt an exemption from CEQA. What the bill does is tells us we have to develop a checklist, uh, we have to accept the plans as complete as long as the checklist is, com is uh, attached and signed. And we have to do it either by web, by fax, or by email. Uh, we are in the process of putting those programs together. We will be accepting them by email until such time as uh, hopefully after the first year, we will in fact launch an online plan submittal process mostly for large projects, not necessarily driven by this ordinance. Uh, it is, in my opinion, an unfunded mandate. However, what the state will tell you in the analysis of the bill is the fees can be, or the cost can be recovered by fees. They did, however, put a cap on the fees. Um, pleased to share with you that our costs of running the operation do not reach the cap. Uh, and as is stated in the fiscal impact section, uh, when we uh, come forward with the new fees, particularly for the building department, um, we will certainly be somewhat cost negative. Uh, I already have fees in the fire department. Interesting enough, this bill did not address the requirements of the fire code, and it did exempt the, the city's process under our electric department because uh, you can't, uh, the solar energy folks, the, the residences, have to have an agreement, have to pay fees to our uh, electric department. Those were not overridden by the bill. Um, I am asking that you consider introducing the bill this evening, I'm sorry, the ordinance this evening, um, so we can comply with the law by the end of the month. I'm free to answer any unbiased questions you may have. Chief, just a, a question and it's sort of a comment, I guess. Um, First of all, we are still issuing permits for rooftop solar. Uh, yes, and our, and our turnaround is very quick. Okay. The reason I say that is I've had several people come to me and say, you know, Bob, why, why did the city stop issuing permits? They've been talking to people at Home Depot at Solar City, and Solar City was actually telling customers that the city of Lompoc was no longer issuing permits. So I was over there this past weekend to talk to the person at He's a salesperson. He was just getting instructions from down below. And actually, supposedly corporate at Solar City was telling them to say that, and I couldn't understand why. So just for the public out there, um, we are still issuing um, permits for uh, rooftop solar, and we still have so a rebate program going. So, so I can't speak to the rebate program. Well, I believe we're capped. No, no, we still, we still offer it. Okay, we do have a rebate program. Yes, we have still have a re rebate program. So. But we are issuing permits. We actually just issued a couple last week. Okay, good. Uh, the other thing is the um, report, staff report under fiscal impact, it says there is, um, it says, uh, uh, relatively minor fiscal impact. But there is an impact to the city because as we add more and more rooftop solar, our revenue does decrease somewhat. So there is, there is a fiscal impact with and, this. And I cannot address that. I, I'll let Larry uh, take care of that. The impact has to do with the process of plan checking, issuing to the permits, and conducting the inspections. There's a separate fee for, for what our electric department does relative to these projects. Okay. 
and that's fine. You're okay, Larry. Okay, any other questions or any questions for Thank Chief Lada Powell? Okay, uh, bring back the council for a motion. Oh, yeah, let's do, go, let's do a public comment first. Public comment on this. Anyone? Okay, we'll close public comment, bring it back to the council for a motion. I'll move the ordinance, adopt an ordinance of providing staff recommendations. Yeah, staff recommendations. There you go. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay, we're going to move on to item number eight adoption of ordinance number 1615, parentheses 15, amending Lompoc Municipal Code section 5.60.050. And this is uh, City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor. As you know, the state has a um, requirement that if a um, mobile home tenant or mobile home owner that rents a space in a mobile home park has a, an agreement that extends past 12 months, then the rent control rules that the city has doesn't apply. And so when a new tenant comes into a mobile home park, the city's code requires, and state law also requires, the tenant to be advised of that fact that if it's more than 12 months, you won't have rent control. We have, we received, my office received a uh, notification from a tenant at a mobile home park indicating that that mobile home park was um, going to the tenants and advising them that they could get certain services or different kinds of services if they entered into an agreement that was more than 12 months. And if they did that, then that would reduce, um, eliminate the rent control. So based on that and looking at our ordinance, the ordinance that we have requires that tenant to be notified when they're becoming a tenant, but not after they're a tenant and some new um, agreement is provided to them. So based on that, um, I uh, suggested that we change the, the ordinance so that we add some language that says, if there's an agreement being proposed either at the time that the tenant is locating into a mobile home park or any time after that, that there's a new agreement being provided that the tenant has to be notified of this 12-month rule. And so that's what this ordinance does. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Public comment. Public comment on this. Closing public comment. Bring it back to the council for discussion and motion. I'll go ahead and move staff recommendation on this. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Thank you. Okay. We're going to now open it up for oral communication. This is your last opportunity to speak to the council for on any issue you so desire. <coughs> Seeing no one rise, we're going to close oral communication. Uh, bring it back to the council for council requests, comments, and meeting reports. We'll start with Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, over the last uh, several months, I had a couple council requests. One was on sewer rates. Um, if we could discuss those, I don't know if we know when that's coming down the pipe. Of course, if we know approximation of time on, on chickens, because I, I went through planning commission and stuff. I don't know if there's an approximation on that. And the th you, You've been through planning commission? Didn't it go through planning commission? Oh, it did, yeah. You were there. <laughs> Chicken I, I think we're scheduled for the next meeting on. That's correct. Chicken. We're scheduled for the fifteenth. What? Yeah. I didn't see it on my. Did I miss it on my pink sheet. Okay. Oh, dates above. Very good on that. And then the third item was. Um, I almost forgot what the third item was. What was my third council request? I don't know on the sewer rates. What exactly you just? We were to discuss the uh, how we come about with minimum, average, and actual rates. Okay. Um, All right. Well, we'll let you know what that 
anticipated return on that one is. And I'll remember my third one here. Okay. Councilman Starbuck. I have no reports. Councilman Humdahl. I just got a couple. One is that uh, a couple weeks ago I did miss a meeting, but Bob, the mayor, went for me. I, I, Air Pollution Control District and had a speaker there talking about El Nino, what the projections are for the El Nino. We've always heard it and been around here once while it changes. This year it's not changing. It's going to be 90% or better chance that El Nino will be here. I've talked to the city and they're already out cleaning out the gutters and everything else and getting things straightened away. So that's the one of the main thing with this. It's an interesting form that they have and talking about what was coming down and, and how bad it, it's going to be in certain areas. It'll start sometime after October 15th. Now the one real blessing for Santa Barbara County and for Lompoc at this time is that we've got three empty dams. And the previous ones that I've lived through in this, in this area, we didn't have empty dams. And a couple of them empty because of a lousy work on a dam. But we have those clean and the, and the city itself is cleaning the gutters. And it now means the public may want to go up there and look at their uh, drain lines on top of the roofs and such to get those clean because it will be a lot of water coming. The, la the one in 97, and 96, 98, 90, 97, 98, we had 47 inches at the ranch. So uh, that, that's coming down. But I just thought uh, it was nice to get that report. We got some good information. And the, the real thing that I've noticed is that we're not getting any negatives. So there was the ones that said six months ago there was going to be an El Nino. They have now progressed all the way up the line. And these are qualified individuals in the science community. Other than that, that's. Oh, and I did make the Human Service Commission, which was a very good uh, commission. I enjoyed that one. And that's it. Okay. Councilman Vega. I did attend the last farmer's market, and I, I'd like to add to Mr. Weimler's comments about the creative crosswalk. Um, some of the excitement that I saw was just watching them paint that thing and put that with the stencils and everything and see the energy and I thought that was a great endeavor. I thought it made, made Lompoc, it made you feel good to see people running around and, and getting excited with something as simple as decorating the crosswalks. I just wanted to make that comment. I made me happy to see these guys and the painters jumping around and, and making it happen right in front of you. So I wanted to make that comment, okay? That's all I have. Thank you. One of the, uh, there's a little comical moment while they're painting the crosswalks, they had the orange barrier tape around the entire thing as they because it was all wet paint. And I don't know who the gentleman was, but it, it was, if you're watching, it's okay, we forgive you. He goes around the barrier tape with his dog and just goes walking about, kind of sort of up, like, oh, what's going on here? So anyway, we got it all taken care of. That, that, was, that was a little comical moment. Okay, let's see, I attended um, many meetings, but there was um, only one at city expense this past week on the 25th, 26th, I, spended, I attended the Northern California Power Agency meeting in Oakland, and that was uh, the city paid my transportation, lodging, and meals, and I drove my own car. That is all I, oh, I'm sorry, I, Councilman Mosby. Yeah, I remembered my third item, which was the, the top 10 list for code enforcement. Okay, good. That was... Anything else? Okay, with that, we are adjourned to a regular city council meeting of September 15th at 6.30 p.m. Good night.